Hello and welcome to episode 11 of the History of BBC Micro Typing Games, where I look at typings for the Beeb that were published in the many computing magazines of the 8-bit era. As well as trying to work out if it was actually worth the time it took to type these games in, I also tried to pick out any interesting content from the mag to help give a taste of the home computer scene at the time. In this edition I'll be concluding my journey through the magazines of 1984, but this time things are a little unusual as I've got five magazines to look at, covering October to December, but I have six games to cover. However, in one of the mags I'm not going to be looking at a typing game at all, whereas I'll be looking at three in one of the others. Don't worry, all will become clear in due course, so let's get started. I'm kicking off this episode with an edition of Popular Computing Weekly, covering the 4th to the 10th of October 1984. And as you can see from one of the headlines on this front page, the US games invasion continues. It says more American software is on its way to Britain for Christmas, this time from a new company, Areola Soft, which has been set up as a sister company to Arista Records and Areola. It goes on to say that so far the company's reached agreement with two of the biggest and fastest growing software companies, Electronic Arts and Broderbund, to market their titles in the UK and Europe. And there's a picture of the impressive Broderbund game Karatika at the bottom there. Also pictured is the company's representative Ashley Gray, who said at first they'll be working on repackaging the titles and putting them on cassette so they'll be first available for the Commodore 64, and then where feasible they'll later be converting to the Spectrum and possibly the MSX as well. Later in the article it says prices for the range aren't fixed yet but they'll be at the upper end of the price spectrum in line with the sort of prices US Gold were charging. Continuing with the news pages inside, and there's an article here that's covering the fallout from the collapse of Imagine Software that occurred earlier in the year. The headline says ex Imagine Directors in Court, and it says at a committal hearing at Liverpool High Court, ex Imagine Software Directors Dave Lawson and Mark Butler were ruled to be in contempt of court after failing to attend a previous hearing. The two had been instructed under a court order to release former Imagine shareholder Steve Blower from the personal guarantee on Imagine's 100 grand bank overdraft. The High Court judge said, however, that it would not benefit Blower if Lawson and Butler were sent to prison or fined for contempt. It goes on to say the overdraft at Lloyds Bank is jointly guaranteed by all three men, each of whom are personally responsible for the full amount if one or both of the others cannot meet their share of the debt. After Imagine went into liquidation in July, Steve Blower obtained the court order instructing Lawson and Butler to remove his name within three days. Blower said they failed to do that and then didn't attend the court hearing when the three days were up, and he's now talking to his solicitor to see what they can do next. I think it's fair to say based on that article that the implosion of Imagine Software was somewhat acrimonious. I've now moved on to this two-page advert for the Commodore 64, with the headline, Are you only using one-tenth of your brain? It says, to only play games on a Commodore computer is like asking Albert Einstein to work out the square root of four. The computer's brain barely ticks over. To really stretch it, you need to have more interesting software programs, for example record keeping, interactive education, stimulating adventure games or word processing. This advert is obviously designed to showcase the business capabilities of the Commodore 64, showing off a host of peripherals on the right hand side. The irony of course is that anyone looking for a more serious computer in the UK probably went for something like a BBC Micro or maybe the Amstrad CPC 464 with a green screen, while the Commodore 64 was almost exclusively looked at as a games machine in this country. Not much else of interest stood out from this magazine, so let's move on to the games listing, and this has the caption at the top, Guess What's for Dessert? It then says, Pack up your BBCB and travel if you dare to Cannibal Island by Glyn Evans. So the game's actually called Cannibal Island. The introduction says this is a simple adventure game written in BASIC on the BBC Micro in Mode 7, although it doesn't have many locations, the program is designed so that more data can be added. The scenario is a desert island in the tropics, and the object is to find the lost treasure and return to your ship. The program understands most of the basic commands and then goes on to give an overview of how to play a text adventure basically. Yes, this is a text adventure, which is a genre I'm not particularly fond of generally speaking, but I thought it would be interesting to look at how a text adventure is implemented in basic, so I'm actually more interested in the program listing on this one than the game itself. There's a short overview of the program structure, mainly listing what procedures are used, and then it jumps to the listing itself which spans two pages and is almost 180 lines. A good proportion of the second page is made up of data statements defining the locations in the game. Each location is covered by two successive data statements, the first one giving a description of the location, while the second one is a sequence of numbers. Each of the six digits relates to the number of another location that you can move to from the one you're currently in, by going north, south, west, east, up or down. So for example if we look at location 2 on line 1020, it's got a data statement describing that you're on the deck of the ship, and then the following statement on line 1030 shows that you can't go north, south or west, but you can go east to location 4, up to location 3 and down to location 1. Proc Describe on line 300 actually reads from those statements. You can see on line 310 that it does a calculation to work out which line number to restore the data from. So you've got L times 20, L being the location number, and then it adds 980. So for example, location 1 times 20 would be 20, add 980 is 1000, and line 1000 is where the first location data is held. 
It then reads the description of the location into Z string and the possible locations you can move to into the N, S, W, E, U and D variables. You can see how those location variables are referenced in lines 640 to 690, where it checks if you're typing in north, south, west or east for example, and then checks if the corresponding value is non-zero and moves you to the relevant location. That makes for a pretty smart game engine and it means that if you wanted to add extra locations, all you'd have to do is add additional data statements to the end of the program and point some of the existing locations towards them. Objects are handled in a similar way, this time being stored in an array with the names and description of each object being pulled in from a data statement on line 250. Following that, another array is populated with the initial location of each object. And you can see further down that proc object reads from that array to decide whether to display the object in the current location. There's also a pretty comprehensive list of commands that you can enter, the response to which seems to vary depending on which location you're in. All in all, it seems like a pretty cleverly designed program, so let's see what the end result's like. In a rare occurrence for games in this series, there's no instructions in this one, though I guess the assumption is that you read the intro in the magazine or already know how a text adventure works. You do get an introduction to the story though, informing you that you've been shipwrecked on a desert island and must find Blackbeard's treasure. Not sure what you're going to do with it if you find it, given that you're shipwrecked, but never mind. Pressing a key begins the quest, and it takes the usual format for text adventures, giving you a description of each location, along with any objects present and exits from it. Well, actually, it doesn't always tell you all the exits from each location, so some trial and error is needed in places. The game has a reasonably good pauser, which allows for single letter directional commands and shortened three letter versions of all the words. Quite a few actions are recognised, but some common terms like examining use are not supported. There's a fairly small number of locations to explore, but quite a bit of backtracking is required, so that makes it seem like a bigger game. You can only carry a maximum of three items at once, so the low inventory capacity makes it more challenging as you need to leave things in the right place to save going back to pick them up again later. On my first play, I seemingly got stuck in the jungle without being able to find any new locations, but after looking at the program code, I worked out how to escape the jungle and get to the cannibal village. I then managed to solve a few puzzles but got stuck in a maze which is probably quite near the end of the game, but that was enough for me to get a decent sense of what it's like. It is pretty bare bones, but certainly not the worst text adventure I've played, though it would definitely benefit from some colour to make it a little more visually interesting. There are a few reasonably taxing puzzles and you can make fair progress without fear of being randomly killed like you do in many of these types of game. You can die, but there aren't too many places where you die easily and you usually have to make a decision yourself before that happens, so you don't feel too cheated. Text adventures are certainly not my kind of game, but it was interesting to see how the program code works and this has plenty of scope for enhancement, enlargement or even creating a whole new adventure using the game engine once you understand it. Let's take a look at the next magazine then, and I'm moving from one PCW to another. This is the November 1984 edition of Personal Computer World. And the first thing I noticed about this compared to the issue I looked at in the last episode of this series is that the price has gone up from 85 pence to 95 pence. You still get a bumper number of pages though, this one's got 363 of them. As usual, it's mostly adverts for computer hardware and software. And on the front cover here, we've got an image of Mr. Spot, which I'm sure was officially licensed from the producers of Star Trek. And he's been used to help symbolise that they're reviewing the new Enterprise computer, which you can see depicted below, along with the caption, Enterprise comes into land with an exclusive bench test. And I will be taking a little look at that article. First though, I'm jumping to page 113 for a double page advert for a much more well-known computer, which was also released in 1984, the Amstrad CPC 464. This has been released in April of 1984, so it's been around for a few months at this point, and as you can see, they're promoting it with the headline, before you compare our new computer system with any other, double the price, and that's indicating the fact that you're getting a lot for your money. For £249, you get the complete computer with a green screen, and for £359, the green screen monitor is replaced with a colour one. Of course, most similar computers at this time were retailing for between £200 and £300 without a screen, so this really would have seemed like good value at the time, and it's not surprising that it soon became the third best-selling home computer in the UK, behind the ZX Spectrum and the Commodore 64, relegating the more expensive BBC Micro to fourth place. There's a couple of nice pictures of the system, and following the introductory paragraph, the advert goes into detail about the RAM, high-resolution graphics and stereo sound, the green screen VDU, some of the software available for the system, and also some of the peripherals you could add on to it. It also mentions that the system's available from many of the big retailers of the time, including Boots, Comet, Dixons, Menzies and Rumbelows. I'll move on now to that cover feature, the bench test of the Enterprise computer from Intelligent Software. There's a picture of it on the first page of this article, and it really is a distinctive looking piece of hardware, with its unusual shaped case, colourful keys and a built-in joystick that looks awful. 
Above that picture, the intro says, Plagued by production delays and a serious identity crisis, the Enterprise finally comes a year late to launch. But what was once an impressive specification now looks only poor for the course. There's then several pages covering the machine, detailing everything from the technical specs to the basic capabilities, software and documentation. I'm not going to look at that in any detail in this video, but feel free to do so in your own time if you're interested. Jumping to the final page, there's a conclusion that amongst other things says currently the Enterprise will only really appeal to programmers attracted to its structured basic, nicely designed operating system and technical specification. But if software houses support the machine, its appeal will obviously be wider. Actually though, the box art entitled In Perspective probably sums up the machine better, saying the Enterprise is aimed at the top end of the home market. With the Sinclair Spectrum dominating the cheap home micro sales, this is probably the most contested area of micro sales. The Enterprise offers the best basic and internal architecture in its class, with its only rival being the Sinclair QL. It goes on to say a number of other machines have different attractions that may lure potential purchases away from the Enterprise. The Commodore 64 and Atari 800 XL have vast software libraries, Amstrad includes a colour monitor and cassette built into a single integrated unit, the QL offers fast secondary storage and a suite of business programs, and the MSX range offers a sort of software compatibility unknown to home users. It then compares the price of the system to some of the others in the same class, rounding off by saying the Enterprise obviously thinks it has found the right price niche for its machine, but equally obviously, it faces a struggle establishing itself against such close competition. Ultimately, as I'm sure you could guess, this is another of the many 8-bit computers launched in the early to mid-80s that fell by the wayside due to poor marketing, supply issues and lack of software support. Reading about it on Wikipedia, it seems only 25,000 units were sold in the UK, and the company that produced it went out of business in 1986. I was also quite surprised to find that several of the big games publishers such as Ocean and US Gold did produce some titles for the Enterprise, though its total games library number is under 100. Not surprisingly, its poor sales and relative rarity mean you can expect to pay several hundred pounds for it on eBay if you're interested in it. Since this issue of the magazine would have been coming out just a couple of months before Christmas, I thought it was worth taking a look at an advert for some of the more popular computer systems and seeing how much they were retailing for at this point in time. This is a multi-page advert from the confusingly named Spectrum computers who have nothing to do with the ZX Spectrum, although they do sell it, and you can see here that the ZX Spectrum 48K was retailing at £129.95 with a free software six-pack worth £56.70. The Sinclair QL cost a hefty £399. The Commodore 16 had recently been released and would set you back £139.99, while a Commodore 64 package was on offer for £249, consisting of the system, a joystick, the cassette recorder and four cassette-based games. Flipping over to the next two pages, the Commodore Plus 4 would cost you £300. The BBC Model B was still retailing at £399, although it does include a free cassette recorder and five pieces of software. And the Beeb's little brother, the Acorn Electron, would cost you £199.95. And finally, if you preferred to pick yourself up an Atari, you could get the 800XL for £199.99 or the 600XL for under a hundred quid, which seems like a pretty good price. I think you had to pay extra for the cassette recorder or disc drive for those two though. There's also a vast number of printers on offer here, from the low priced Brother HR5 at 160 quid, all the way up to the Brother HR15, which is nearly £500. Let's move on to the game listing then, and this is BBC Golf by Simon Big. And yes, I'm looking at a golf game for the second episode of this series in a row. Last time around I looked at a pretty terrible text-based golf game, but I thought it was only fair to redress the balance by looking at this one. The introduction says golf is a simulation for the BBC Model B. Handicaps, club selection, graphic representation of each hole, and a separate putting screen make this an excellent game. And it already sounds better than the one I looked at in episode 10. Following that opening paragraph, it gives you an overview of how to play the game, which I'm going to skip because the instructions when we look at the game itself will tell us all that. It does, however, say that for cassette-based systems, lines 10 to 50 inclusive must be omitted, as they just move the program down in memory. The first three of those lines begin at the bottom of this page, and there's what looks like a number of machine code statements, which are presumably moving the game higher up in memory. Going back to the intro, it then says that in lines 700 to 1000, embedded teletext codes are used in print statements. In the listing they are printed in reverse video as detailed below, and the box out then gives an overview of different colours and the function keys associated with them. All of that makes the game seem a little bit intimidating to type in, and it's not helped by the fact that the listing is in the usual tiny font size that this magazine provides them in. It covers about two and a half pages and consists of around 300 lines. Due to the tiny font size, I'm not going to be looking at this listing in too much detail, but there are a couple of things I wanted to pick out. In the first dozen or so lines of the program, you can see it calls a number of procedures, which I believe are to draw each hole on screen. You can see PROC P hole here, and that's followed by PROC TREE, which is only executed if a previously generated random number is above 6. 
That's then followed by Proc Fairway, Proc Green and Proc Bunker to draw the obvious elements on the screen. And then there's another check here that says if D% percent, which is the length of the hole is greater than 450 and less than 550 then it executes Proc River. So I'm expecting it to draw quite a few landscape elements on each hole. Quickly looking at some of the procedures I just mentioned, we can see Proc Fairway, Proc Green and Proc River on the following page. And within each of those procedures, you can see commands such as Move, Plot, Point, Gcol and Draw, which confirms that the program is going to be using the Beebs graphical plotting commands to draw the course on screen. I was expecting this listing to have quite a lot of data statements defining the layout of each hole, but actually there's just a single data statement at the very end of the listing, specifying the length and par for each of the holes in order. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how it generates the layout of each hole based on what seems like a very small amount of information. And with that, let's take a look at the game and find out. Let's begin by taking a look at the instructions then. It should be noted that these weren't part of the original listing in the magazine. These have been added by the person that typed it in for the BBC Micro Games Archive and they basically repeat what was printed in the magazine. The key things to pick out here are that club selection is done by picking a number with 1 to 4 representing the woods and 11 to 19 representing the 9 irons. It also says that if you select a wood you'll be prompted to select fade or draw and if you select an iron you'll be asked to enter a percentage swing where 10 is a gentle tap and 90 is an all out belt. Also, when you get to the green, you're asked to enter a number between 1 and 15 for the power of the put. On the following screen, you can enter your handicap from 0 to 30, 30 meaning you're a rank amateur, which is what I entered. And you can also pick what you feel is your biggest difficulty in golf, slicing, hooking, poor distance, trap shots or putting, and presumably the game's slightly more forgiving on whichever one of these you choose. For the record, I decided to say putting was my biggest weakness. After that, you're given a reminder of the numbers corresponding to each club you can choose from, along with the approximate yardage applying to each one. You can then press any key to start the game. You're then presented with an overhead view of the first of 18 holes, along with the par and distance, and must play your round following the instructions I've already mentioned. Just as I did with the text-based golf game in the last episode, I'll be speeding up the footage of this one to show as many holes as possible while I'm talking about it. Firstly, it should already be clear that there's some pretty nice graphics here. The overhead view of each hole is well done using the Beebs graphical plotting commands, and many of the holes have nice details like trees and water. Even things like the fairway width and green size are varied from one hole to the next. From what we just looked at in the listing, these features are generated somewhat randomly or derived entirely from the length of the hole. That makes the fact that the course layout looks quite convincing, a pretty impressive piece of programming. When you get the ball onto the green, the view switches to side on for the final approach to the hole. The graphics here are quite basic and the ball is huge, but the movement of it is smooth and the change in viewpoint is well thought out and adds some variety to the visuals. So graphically it's good, but the same can't be said for the sound effects, as all you get is a simple beep for each shot. It would have been nice if there had been a club swing sound for the shot, or something for when you sink the putt or get birdies or bogeys. The club selection by numbers is quite hard to remember, and the ability to see a reminder of what the numbers correspond to, or being able to specify a wood or iron by letter would have made things easier. The ability to add draw or fade on the woods and shot power on the irons does give quite a lot of control, but there isn't an option to have neither draw or fade. That seems strange as sometimes you just want to hit a straight shot and don't seem to be able to. The biggest issue though is that the game doesn't tell you the distance of the shot you just played, or the distance remaining to the hole once the ball is in play. It only shows the overall length of the hole. That makes it very hard to correctly choose the right club or power level when the ball is off the tee. The green speed can vary from one hole to the next and that makes consistent putting challenging. The speed on each hole is also randomly chosen from one game to another, so that adds some inconsistency to each game. Another thing that could make each game different is those choices of handicap and weakness at the beginning, though it wasn't clear what impact they have from the few rounds I played. It's not shown in the video footage, but if you land in a bunker it can take some serious effort and shrewd club selection to get out. This only happened to me once, but it took me 3 or 4 shots to escape the sand around the green. It will take a lot of practice to work out the correct clubs to use on each hole and the power of putting for each green speed, but to be fair, that's what makes golf one of the hardest games in the world in real life. You'd really need to make notes about which clubs work for each shot on each hole to get really good at the game. When the game ends a scorecard is shown, but the layout of it is a little confusing and it would have been nice to be able to see it at any time by pressing a key, or at least between holes. For the time, this is really not a bad golf simulation, with nice graphics and fairly good control over your shots. The only real failing is not knowing how far you are from the hole after the first shot, and that's something you could probably tweak the program to display. 300 lines of code is a lot to type in and the text size in the magazine doesn't help, but you do get a pretty impressive game out of it that has plenty of scope for enhancements, such as changing the whole layouts, improving the presentation and sound, and maybe even trying to add a multiplayer mode. It's certainly a huge improvement over last episode's golf game, though ironically there are a couple of elements of that game that could be incorporated here to improve it.
Time to move on to the third magazine now, and this is the November 1984 edition of the Micro User, with a very impressive Egyptian look to the front cover artwork. And this is where I'm going to break from the normal routine in this series, because although there are two typing games mentioned on the front cover here, Duel and Blockbuster, I'm not actually interested in either of those, but there is an article in this magazine that I think is very significant in the history of gaming on the BBC Micro, and that's really the only reason I'm featuring this magazine, although I'm going to pick a couple of other things out while I'm looking at it. The first of those is a small piece in the news pages with the headline British Telecom launches Firebird and if you've been a subscriber to my channel for a number of years you'll know exactly why this interested me. It says British Telecom has entered the software market with 20 new games, four of them for the BBC Micro, under the Firebird label. Despite being priced at only £2.50 each, the games are said by BT to be the same quality as some products costing twice as much. The first releases are all games, but educational software and other types of programs will be produced at a later date, as will a series of premium range programs according to a company spokesman. So this was effectively the launch of Firebird's budget Silver Range, which of course was the subject of my Silverbird selection series, in which I reviewed every budget game released by Firebird for the Commodore 64, but I did also do a one-off episode featuring four BBC Micro games, which I'll put a link to in the corner of this video now. Now for the main reason for looking at this magazine, because I believe this is probably the most prominent early review of Acornsoft's classic Elite, considered by many to be the BBC Micro's most defining game. The game was actually released in September 1984, and I'm sure it would have first been reviewed by Acorn User, but you couldn't really call that an impartial review because Acorn User and Acornsoft were closely linked. Unfortunately, it has to be said that this review is rather understated. It's a half-page review with no screenshots of the game and no cover artwork either. The headline for the review says strategy enters the shoot 'em up scene, and it begins by saying trying to review Elite is rather like trying to rewrite the BBC's manual to fit on a postage stamp. This is the first Acornsoft mega game and let's hope there are more to come. There are then several paragraphs giving an overview of how to play the game, before it says that there are more than 250 planets in each of the 8 galaxies, so there's plenty of scope for exploration and profit. One criticism they level was that there's no scope for alliances which could have made the whole game much more interesting. Not that the game lacks in interest, as it's a type that keeps you up at night and leaves you feeling somewhat drained the day afterwards. It goes on to say the graphics are one of its major features and can only be described as spectacular. The program gives the impression that there are two screen modes in Windows at one and the same time. After describing those screens and graphics over a couple of paragraphs, the reviews then rounded off by saying the package contains a 64 page training manual, a quick reference card, a 48 page novella, a function key strip, a spaceship recognition poster, loading instructions and a competition entry card, and rounds things off by saying this is not a game for the dyslexic. It is not overpriced and should keep the kids quiet for many many eons. So there you go, while it is complimentary to some extent, it's not exactly throwing the superlatives at the game and it's a pretty unassuming write-up for what would become one of the biggest selling and most popular games of the 8-bit era and beyond. Nevertheless, I thought it was worth including in this video for its historical significance. The only other thing I want to look at in this issue of the Micro User is some Micro Power adverts because we haven't looked at any of these for a couple of episodes and they're always nice to look at and there's actually several of them in this magazine. The first of those is on page 99, and this is for Swag, which is a two-player game of dexterity set in Hazard County. Beat your opponents to the jewels and gold with the help of your band of cronies, and it randomly says it includes police cars and one-player practice option. I must admit I'd completely forgotten about this game, but I was quite fond of it back in the day. There's a screenshot shown and also a nice piece of artwork showing the two rivals facing off against each other, along with gold and diamonds in the foreground and some cute looking robots on the left and right hand side. Later in the magazine there's an advert for Felix Meets the Evil Weevils, which is the third game in the Felix series, and the best in my opinion. This is a great little platform where you have to run backwards and forwards on conveyor belts, clambering up the pipes, dodging the cascading ball bearings to dispatch the weevils using your spray can. Once again there's some great artwork that depicts the game really well, and a screenshot in the bottom left hand corner. If you've never played this one and you're a fan of a single screen clear all the enemies to progress platformer, then this one's highly recommended. And finally on the back cover is an advert for Mr. E, which is of course a clone of the universal arcade game Mr. Do, and in my opinion is almost arcade perfect, and still stands up as a great game even now. Once again there's some vibrant artwork, and while it does feature things like the apples, cherries and wizard from the game, the interpretation of the enemies is a little bit off on this one. Nevertheless it's still a great example of the colourful adverts that Micropower produced for all their games in this era. Up next is the December 1984 issue of Acorn Programs, and unsurprisingly this has something of a Christmas theme on the front cover, although it's pretty tacky looking with its bright yellow background and a rear view of Santa Claus. This issue introduces a pull-out called Acorn World, and there's also a competition mentioned in the corner here saying win a beastie, 
I'm going to be taking a look at both of those in this issue, but first let's jump to the news pages and the main headline here is that foreign sales hamper growth and it says Acorn Computers announced record profit of 10.5 million for the year to July the 1st 1984 and profit in the UK was 14 million representing an increase of 58% over the previous year, but overseas sales especially in the US fell below expectations. Commenting on the figure, Acorn Chairman Herman Hauser said despite our disappointment with the overseas performance we consider the figures demonstrate a satisfactory rate of growth. I'd hope so with a profit of 10.5 million in 1984. He goes on to say the population of BBC Micros in the UK is now around 370,000 and sales of the Acorn Electron reached 90,000 since its launch in October 1983 and Acorn predicted another major business boost from sales of both machines over the Christmas period. Hauser went on to say the main growth area in 1985 however is expected to be the sale of upgrade and expansion facilities for the large installed base of computers. So this largely just validates what most of us already knew, which was the BBC Micro was really popular in the UK, but not particularly successful anywhere else. At this point that hadn't deterred Acorn however, because this other article says as part of an overseas sales push, Acorn sent a representative on a trade mission to the Gulf states. Derek Lee, regional manager for the Middle East, hopes to promote a new Arabized version of the BBC Micro with an Arabic and European text processor and Arabic keyboard. Acorn has its sights set on the Middle East educational market. I've got no idea if anything ever came of that sales push, so if you've got any information about it then please let me know in the comments. And just to round things off from the news pages, we've got the BBC B Top 10 and there's no surprise to find that two months after its release, Acorn Soft Elite is at the top of the charts. In second place is a classic platform of Frack from Aardvark Software, and in third place is Pace Software's Zaxxon clone Fortress, which was actually in second place in the chart I looked at in the September edition of this magazine that I looked at in episode 10, so that's holding its position surprisingly well. Moving on to page 18, here's that competition that was mentioned on the front cover, and a beastie and four fabulous movies are waiting to be won in their great Christmas competition. And it says, to make sure Acorn Programmes readers move with the times, the prizes open the exciting new world of robotics and automation. The big prize is a beastie interface from Commotion, together with two S128 servos, worth a total of almost £60. Plugged into the BBC Model B with OS version 1 or above, the beastie and servos can twist, open, close and generally manipulate objects under computer control. What was more interesting to me about this competition though was the four runner-up prizes which are Prism Movits and I looked at an advert for these standalone robots in the last episode but I'll put a picture of them on screen now just to remind you. To win one of these cool prizes you had to solve a logic problem called the Christmas Party Conundrum. It says the organiser of the office Christmas party was having a difficult time, he couldn't find a venue big enough to accommodate all the staff and there'd have to be two parties at different places. Each of the two venues had a different seating capacity which had to be filled exactly. Unfortunately, each of the various groups of staff insisted on going as one undivided group to the same party. No matter how hard he tried, the organiser could find no way of doing this. In desperation, he wrote a computer program to find the solution, and the computer said there was no solution. So it asked you to write a program on your BBC Micro or Electron to solve the question of what the seating capacity was at each of the two venues, and to assist with that, it gives you a list of all the groups working at the office and the numbers in each one. I have to say that sounds quite challenging and I'm not sure they would have got too many entries for this competition but at least the prizes were worth winning if you put the effort in. Let's now take a look at the pullout supplement introduced in this magazine, Acorn World, and as you can see on the front of it here it says meet the elite team and there's a picture of David Braben looking stylish and Ian Bell looking rather depressed on the front here. An interview with both developers is the main feature in this pullout and the headline says Limitless Horizons for the Elite Team with Nicole Segra setting out to discover what drives two top flight programmers who are finding fame and fortune as authors of the new chart busting space odyssey from Acornsoft. So unlike that rather understated micro user review of Elite, this magazine is making a big thing about the game and while I'm not going to cover it in too much depth, I will pick out a couple of interesting points. The first of those is that the game's been greeted by rapturous reviews, although perhaps not that micro user one, and it says the game has already exceeded the company's wildest expectations by rocketing straight to the top of the popularity charts and selling 13,000 copies within two weeks of its launch. Forecasts for sales during the Christmas period are in the region of 100,000, more than double those of any other Acornsoft game so far. It says behind what promises to be a sales record breaker are two unassuming undergraduates at Jesus College, Cambridge, 20-year-old Ian Bell and 19-year-old David Braben. The pair wrote Elite in the spare time allowed them in pursuit of a natural science and mathematics degree respectively. There's then a fairly extensive overview of the game which I think we all know perfectly well, but a couple of other comments worth picking out are that Bell said if the BBC had more memory they'd probably still be writing it, as it is there's not a single byte free in the programme, and that the authors agree that careful economical programming enabled them to squeeze much more into the game than they would have originally thought possible. It mentions that both programmers taught themselves machine code for which Bell recommends pouring over other people's listings, Perhaps the most interesting comment in the interview though is that they managed to remain on the best of terms during the programming process. 
Raven says they never bickered because if they did they would never have finished the programme and according to Bell the secret of good relations was that whenever we disagreed we'd blame the assembler not each other. Sadly as we now know that relationship unfortunately didn't last very long beyond the production of this game. And closing out the article, the final slightly amusing point is that apparently neither is an avid games player, and although they try their hand occasionally at Elite, they've not progressed beyond the competent stage. The article's rounded off by saying, with no such time limits on their programming, it seems likely that both will go a long way, and in the case of Braben, that was definitely true. Time to move on to the games listing from this magazine then, and there are plenty to choose from, but I've gone for Dennis in the Mines, or In the Mine as it's called here, and surrounding this two-page listing are some nice little cartoons featuring Dennis picking up some diamonds and some creatures that he might encounter in the mine as well. The intro says Stephen Flood of Thornton Cleveley's Lancashire supplies another adventure for Dennis. Following his escape on the farm in the June-July issue, Dennis finds himself deep in some South African mines. His mission is to collect as many diamonds as possible, while avoiding the perils of deadly green monsters and red bombs. As I just mentioned, this listing covers two pages in the magazine and has just over 2,000 lines, but if you look a little closer, a lot of those lines are completely empty and used to separate out the different procedures, which makes it very easy to read through and also means there's a lot less lines to type in than it first appeared. In terms of the content of this listing, it's very straightforward. There's nothing here that we haven't seen a number of times before in previous episodes of this series, so I'm not going to spend any time looking at the detail of this one and jump straight into the game. The game has a nicely presented single page of instructions in mode 7, repeating the game scenario that I've just mentioned from the magazine, and adding that when a monster approaches a diamond, it picks it up and replaces it at a random position in the mines. The bombs never move, but increase in number as the game progresses. It also lists the keys, which are Z and X for left and right, and asterisks and question mark for up and down, the BBC standard, and there are also keyboard commands for switching the sound on and off, pausing, resuming and aborting the game. Pressing space will then begin the game. I must admit, I was expecting this to be a platformer based on the name and premise, but it's a pretty simple maze game where you must collect all the diamonds to complete a level, whilst avoiding the monsters and bombs. The Mode 2 graphics are functional I suppose, with your character Dennis looking quite cute, but otherwise there's nothing noteworthy. The sound effects are basic too, with a fairly annoying beep each time you move your player through the maze. The overall presentation isn't bad though, with your score, level and lives displayed on screen, options to switch the sound on or off, and a high score table to enter your name into when the game ends. The game's easy enough for the first couple of stages as you have plenty of routes through the mine and the enemies move quite slowly. On later stages, the maze layouts get more complex and more bombs are added that block your path, though you can still progress easily enough if you take care. The main problem with the game is there's no real incentive to complete a level quickly, as there's no time limit or bonus to earn, so you can take as long as you like. It's reasonably playable for a single attempt as is, but it needs improvement to make it replayable. If you added things like enemies that chase you on later stages, perhaps some teleporters and most importantly a bonus or timer to encourage you to move more quickly, it might make for a half decent game. The good news of course is that with the listing being fairly short and simple, there should have been plenty of room for improvements if you so desired. The final magazine I'm looking at in this episode is the December 1984 edition of B-Bug magazine and as you can see it's got a very festive red and green colour scheme and a Christmas tree on the cover adorned with various gifts containing images representing the content of this issue. I did say at the beginning of the episode that I was going to be looking at three games from one magazine and since this is the last one I'm going to be looking at you can probably work out that this is the one that's got the three games in but if you're thinking that means this video is going to go on forever then don't worry because they shouldn't take too long to look at. Given this is a Christmas edition and people are probably looking for software to buy as Christmas gifts, this edition features a bumper selection of games reviews entitled Games Galore and there are two reviews that stood out to me because they tie in nicely with the adverts I looked at in the micro user earlier in this episode. They're both games from Micropower and the first one, Swag, was reviewed by Alan Webster and given three stars saying it's a brand new one or two player game for the BBC Micro featuring Mode 2 multicolored graphics and a practice feature where you can play against the computer. It's rounded up by saying overall Swag is a very hectic and enjoyable game with a lot of shooting and action and at 6 95 gives good value for money. The second game, also reviewed by Alan Webster, is Micropower's Mr. E and he says Mr. E is an excellent version of the arcade game Mr. Do and must rate as one of Micropower's best releases yet. The review's rounded off by saying if you're looking for one special game this Christmas then you should seriously consider this one and he rates it 4 stars which I think is the top rating in this magazine and I couldn't agree more with him. 
If Games Week you think is a possible Christmas gift, then earlier in the magazine is a good selection of book reviews, and these tie in nicely with this series because they're all about typing listings. Books featured include Practical Programs for the BBC Micro, the Handbook of Procedures and Functions for the BBC Micro, and several collections of games listings. Games for your BBC Micro and More Games for your BBC Micro by Alex Golner are very reasonably priced at £2.95 each, and the reviewer says none of these is going to make the local arcade fearful for its profits, but they do cram a reasonable amount of entertainment into very few programme lines. These books would make great Christmas presents for the very new owner of a BBC Micro. The most highly recommended book though is on the following page, the BBC Micro Games Master, published by Granada at £5.95. The reviewer says the production and presentation of this book is excellent and the programme listings are amongst the best he's seen for the clarity of printing. Equally, the authors have exploited all the best features of BBC Basic to present well-designed and structured programmes of excellent quality. This one seems to be aimed at more experienced programmes that have already mastered Basic and it says many useful techniques are developed in the course of presenting a total of six complete computer games and the authors have not been frightened to introduce sections of machine code where appropriate. Anyone who's keen to develop their own computer games should read this book, but it will have less to offer for those who are just looking for a book of listings. And on the subject of listings, let's now move on to the games listings from this magazine, which are on the very next page, and it says to keep you amused over the Christmas break, this page contains three complete and challenging games. These games will certainly provide plenty of fun and frustration, and furthermore, each program is written as a single line of basic and shows how much can be achieved in such a short space. So yeah, amazingly, inside these three gift boxes are three complete games for the BBC Micro that fit on a single line of code. The article makes it clear that the programs are extensively abbreviated so that the line will fit into Basic's keyboard buffer. Because of this, you can't edit a listed version, and so to allow for errors, it's best to spool out a copy of the text to tape or disk initially, and there's instructions on how to do that. As you'd expect, there aren't going to be any instructions for these games in the listing, so it does then give a pretty detailed summary of how to play each one. As for the listings themselves, well as you can see they're very economical, with almost all spaces removed and almost every command shortened to one or two letters. Just looking at this first one, I think I can pick a few commands out that I recognise. We've got rep which is repeat and I think u later on will be the until, so it's doing some kind of loop. We've got mo which I think is mode, so it's putting the game into mode 4. And we've got dr which I believe will be draw, so we've got some kind of graphical plotting routines being used as well. There's also the generation of some random numbers, and the prompt for keyboard input here with two in-key commands. The other two listings are similarly crammed with just about as many basic commands as you could possibly fit in a single line, so it's certainly going to be interesting to see if these produce any kind of a playable game. So let's take a look at them now. When you boot up the disc image from the BBC Micro Games Archive, you're presented with a simple menu system. This wasn't included in the magazine, but it's a nice way to be able to launch the three games, giving the name and controls for each one. First up is Asterisk Tracker, where you must navigate a constantly moving line from one side of the screen to the other and avoid crashing into the asterisks. The line initially moves downwards at a 45 degree angle and the only control you have is to press return, which changes the direction to 45 degrees upwards when you hold it down. The more screens you complete, the more obstacles are added for you to avoid, and if you hit an asterisk or the wall, the game ends. The second game is Truffle Hunt, which is a similar concept, but this time the line travels up the screen and can be moved left or right to avoid the red asterisks, while also collecting the yellow truffles. When the line reaches the top of the screen, it will reappear at the bottom, making the play area more congested as time progresses. You can also move the line off one side of the screen and it will reappear on the other. Again, you only have one life, and any collision with an asterisk or your own trail ends the game. This time, though, you get a score depending on how long you've lasted and how many truffles you've collected. The final game is Treasure Hunt, which sees you controlling an asterisk using four directional keys, looking for the hidden treasure. Your distance from the treasure is noted at the top of the screen and will increase or decrease as you move around, allowing you to home in on the treasure and end the game. The number of moves you've taken is also displayed, and the aim is to find the treasure in as few moves as possible. All three of the games are very simple, with standard ASCII character based graphics and minimal sound, but you can't really expect anything more from a single line game, can you? Truffle Hunt is the best of the bunch, both graphically and in the concept, while Treasure Hunt is quite dull and getting a good score is pretty random, depending on how far you are away to start with. These are really just impressive demos of what can be achieved in just a single line of basic code. All three games offer a framework from which to create something more substantial, and the first two have some replay value as they stand, so would be worth expanding on. In terms of whether they're actually worth typing in, well, they're only a line each, so why wouldn't you?
That does it for episode 11 of the History of BBC Micro Typing Games, whose format was a little different to the usual episodes. This was an odd one in that the actual games weren't anything I'd be particularly excited by, but with the exception of Dennis in the Mines, the code that was written to create them was interesting and often quite clever. Cannibal Island offered a game engine that would allow you to create any number of text adventures, Golf generated some nice looking graphics from a combination of simple data values and random numbers, and the three B-Bug games showed just what can be achieved on the BBC Micro with just a single line of basic code. If I was going to pick a favourite this time, then I think Golf stood out as the most impressive, but to be honest, this episode was more about the code than the games. If you enjoyed this video then I'd appreciate you giving it a like and please leave a comment with any thoughts you have about the games or magazines covered. It would also be great if you could share this video with any friends you think would enjoy it. If you want to find out more about any of the featured magazines or games check out the pinned comment for links to them all. My chronological look through the magazines of 1984 has come to an end but I'm still not quite done with that year because coming up I have two specials and the majority of games in those are from 1984. One of them features four typing games from one of the Beeb's most prolific coders, while the other focuses on four games inspired by a well-known space movie saga that I happen to be a huge fan of. I'm not exactly sure which of them I'm going to release next, but you'll find out in the coming weeks. Until then, please keep your eye on this channel for more retro gaming content. Thanks very much for watching this video, and I hope you'll tune in for the next one.